gentlemen, however you like to identify your by yourselves. Welcome to a Vic Acres Wonderland. I am joined by Adam. How are you? Um, I'm well. Um, it's been a weekend. It's been a bit calm. Feels like the calm before the storm. You know, the deep breath before the plunge, as I like to say in these sort of situations. Um, you know, the big parties around the corner, but there are a few, a few loose ends we need to tie up um, before the big day. And um, just looking forward to picking over uh, some of the other games that have happened um, over the last few days. Yes, and we'll start very quickly with the Spain versus Sweden first uh, semi-final. Unfortunately, due to technical <laughs> issues, and um, let's just leave it at that for the moment. Well, we'll just want to say, but due to the fact that I, li- I live in a hotel Monday to Friday, um, the Wi-Fi is not as great as it is um, back here. Um, which, but thankfully, um, we're going to give it a proper go over this time around, um, and. Um, it's an interesting game. Um, I think you'll agree, Matt. Um, I'd say for 80 minutes, maybe not so much, but the last 10 minutes, I think there's a fair few bits and bobs we can pick over. Yes, and I think that's the problem, wasn't it, with it with semi-finals? You, sometimes that you get these end-to-end brilliant games, and like then... our like our one, our <laughs> one was our one was brilliant. <laughs> that's not just us picking it up. Right, it's, <laughs> There has been instances like you take the semi-final against Man City in the Conti Cup, edge of your seat sort of stuff, it mm. wasn't it? Whereas um, some other ones, oh, three 0 job done, that's it. It's a, I, I, a I would think fest. back. I think back to the twenty, the men's World Cup twenty ten, uh, when you had like I think it was Ger- no, a Netherlands versus Uruguay, three two game. Yeah, wide open, loads of goals. Van Bronckhorst with an absolute thronk in the top corner. Brilliant game. And on the other side, you had, um, I think it was Germany, Spain, and it was just a dull 1 0 game, just just polar opposites. And it did feel like we got the lucky um, card. We, we got the, 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 the golden raffle ticket on our one. Um, the, but, you know, this one, yes, 80 minutes were naff. Um, and I think there are reasons behind that. Um, it just—it is just a shame we had to get through that to get to the the good and stuff at the end. <laughs> sometimes, uh, uh, um, I was nearly said Arsenal fans. Uh, sometimes football fans in general do have to suffer mm. for. Oh, we've suffered <laughs> for the entertainment, whether it's. Um, but that's the things that we pay for. That yeah, at the end of it, not uh, games of thriller. No, unfortunately not. But Pereiro ended up scoring the first goal of this game on the 81st first minute. I can't seem to get my words out. I do apologise. Um, <laughs> it was, essentially there was a scramble in the box, and Pereiro has got basically turned, and she's just followed it into the top corner. Yep, great goal from uh, uh, Pereiro. Um, a bit of a rising star in this tournament. Um, scored the winner against the Netherlands uh, in the quarterfinals, and got uh, Spain up and running this time around. Um, little. Interesting sort of statistical quirk. Um, in the last two games against Netherlands and Sweden, um, Spain have opened the scoring in the 81st minute. It, it, it's, it, it was 80 minutes in both games. Sort of nothing happened. I think in the Netherlands games, they had a few chances. Van Domstel had a really good game. Some tipped on the post a few times. But Spain, in the, la- in the quarterfinal semifinal, really struggling to break down... Um, teams especially Sweden are quite a defensive team obviously but they're passing the movement they're struggling to convert their dominance into goals um, and if you saw the the preview I did with uh, Unity and this is sort of from one of the things I had was watching Spain at the Euros is that they had this great possession of dominance but against a really good touch size um, like Germany and, and uh, England and maybe to a lesser, uh, um, uh, lesser sense Denmark Really struggled to to score, find goals. I think in, across those three games, they only scored two goals. And I thought that coming to this tournament with Hermoso coming back in, Alexia coming back in, um, there would be enough attacking talent to convert the dominance. And we did see a bit of that in the group stage when they played Zambia. But in the knockout rounds, um, you know, excluding a very poor Switzerland side who very much had an open-door policy when it came to um, Spain's attacks, they have sort of coughed and spluttered a bit, but the goals they have scored have been brilliant. There's, there's no denying it. Pirelli's goal against Neves was superb. This was a very well-taken volley, a bit of a defensive wobble by Sweden, who until then have been quite defensively secure and reliable, but they don't clear the ball properly. And the technique to, to bury this in the bottom corner is very well taken. 
And at that point, you're thinking, right, nine minutes to go. It's one nil. I mean, I was Team Sweden on this um, this game. Let's just put, put it out there. Um, I think if it was one team, I'd rather play in the final. Obviously, we played both teams in the Euros, and they were vastly different experiences. Spain, I hated. Um, and Sweden, I loved. I'd rather play Sweden in the final. And so nine minutes to go, I was sort of wanting Sweden to get back into it, but I sort of had a feeling that this was going to be one nil Spain, and it was just going to you know, play out. I was wrong. Um, there were still a few more twists to come. Um, but certainly at that point, Sweden hadn't really offered anything. They, they, they did, they'd done well to neutralise Spain, but they hadn't really offered any... Um, I think they had one shot on target in the first half. Um, they hadn't really offered any genuine threat. Um, so they need to, obviously, having gone behind, they'd need to step it up. And um, step up, they did. And that came from Blumkoist. Mm-hmm. 88 minutes on the clock. So Spain were in front for seven minutes. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, who was that at the back post that was able to <laughs> head that nice and comfortably to? I Blomkos. know it's, um, it's it's superb, it's superb. It's just brilliant cross in, and who is it? It's Lena Hertig. I mean, what a renaissance she is having at this World Cup. Um, I think any Arsenal fan, um, even the most sympathetic of Arsenal fans, will admit she had a bit of a nightmare season with us. Um, uh, we, you know, came in in the summer. We'd we'd moved on quite a few players. We moved on um, quite a few attacking players that previous summer. Like um, obviously Heath only stayed for a uh, season, then he went with injury, and then Nikita Paris um, again did not have a stellar season with us when she was here. So Herty comes in. You think right, okay, hopefully she can give us a bit of cover for you know say. I don't know, let's say Beth Mead has a horrific injury. You know, we can maybe sub her in and and keep the wheels turning. And unfortunately, a bit like Paris, she had a nightmare season, couldn't stay fit. Um, I remember she limped off against, I think it was Leicester City away and never really got her uh, position back in the team. Had some sort of nightmare games against uh, West Ham and Chelsea. Um, Just couldn't find the net. I I was there for the Conti Cup semi-final against uh, Man City. And, you know, we had to go to extra time. And, you know, fairness, she set up the winner for Stina, but she missed some chances on that night. And there's always been a feeling that there has been a talent there that we just haven't exploited. And I think the big turning point for Hertig was that penalty against the USA. Just winning, being the person to win the shootout. But not only win the shootout, but win the shootout in the manner that she did. Um, it was such a Hertig way to do it. And this, and I know it's just an assist. I mean, it's not the goal, but the header on this cross in is absolutely superb it's perfectly weighted it's perfectly directed and i think this is one of the um aspects to her game that we haven't capitalized on a lot in arsenal um i was talking about her to with i think somebody at one of the games and she said she's very good in the air airily she's very strong um she got a very good header against fc zurich in the champions league and i think she also got one against leeds very strong in the air <clears throat> but the way we played we haven't really played it to our strengths in that matter well sweden did a brilliant header across to Blomqvist and the, the technique to get this volley in. Very Lauren James-esque against China. It's been very easy this late in the game to just lace it and go you know, full-blooded. But it's great control technique to volley this uh, goal um, into the net to get the equaliser at a crucial point in the game um, to get some sort of level right at the death. And that's real character um, shown by Sweden could be very easy to, ch- to chuck in the towel and just, just wilt under Spain. But they, they came back, they got the equaliser. At that point, I'm ecstatic because I'm thinking, right, excellent, extra time penalties. We know Sweden are great with penalties. Well, they're not great at penalties because they lost the, the <laughs> Olympic final and penalties to Canada. But they beat the USA, so obviously they're on the up here. And this, this is going to be their moment where they finally end their semi-final hoodoo and they can take the game for extra time. We didn't get extra time. <laughs> we were robbed of it because of, the, I would say, just... To, as as a, as and the great Alan Hansen would say, they committed defensive suicide. It was just the, the there's an old parlance that you're always at your most vulnerable when you've just scored. I think and rugby happens all the time. What well, great you got to you score a try right kick off you infringe from the kick off penalty to the opposition and they did not three points over and that's yeah you know, you've lost your your grand lead. It did feel like Sweden switched off here. It did feel like they they had their eyes on the full time whistle. They were buzzing because they just equalised. And the greatest irony of this goal that um, Carmona scores is from a set piece. And Sweden have been so strong at set pieces throughout the entire tournament. It's been there. It's been they've, they've done basically tried to do a Gareth Southgate and in 2018 and just set piece their way through the World Cup. And I think we we mentioned uh, on one of the previous pods, 
you need to have a few more um, uh, quills to your bow, um, strings to your bow rather, sorry, uh, than just being a set piece merchant. And I think it, Sweden have all been caught out here at the end. And the ironies of ironies, it was actually set piece that um, that did them in. It was a short corner, rolled here to the box. But take nothing away. The technique from Carmona is superb. Uh, you know, full power. It, it always looks great when it's off the crossbar. And it's in off the crossbar past Musevic. And in just 60 seconds, the game's taken away from Sweden again. And I mean, after that emotionally, they, they had nothing left in the tank. Um, and, and that was the game, really. It, 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 nothing, like I said, nothing happened for 80 minutes. And then in, in a mad sort of um, seven, eight, eight minute period, it was gone. That was it. Um, and Sweden were through and Spain, it's another semi-final blow, um, which is a shame. They, they've had all this talent and we'll get on to a bit later in the pod how that fared for them um, early today. But it's it's another World Cup that slipped through their fingers and they've won, they, until this point, they'd won every game. And yeah, they, they topped the group beat the USA, reigning champions, uh, beat the favourites, uh, one of the favourites, Japan, and then they come up against Spain, and it's again, it's, they've just fumbled it, and it's really, really strange, and it's a real shame, because we had three Arsenal players in that team, um, one of them in for the golden boot, and I was really hoping <laughs> we'd go, get, all, get all the way to the final, but it, it wasn't to be for Sweden, sadly. Yes, yeah, so with Carmona, I it, I've I've talked about this it seems to be a lot where um no matter who it is or what happens is there's not this automatic switch where um defensively people will go and press someone. Mm. They sort of stand if, back yeah. and that allows the long long range shots to come in. It happened we've seen it in the WSL, especially in the North London Derby. Steen has scored a wonderful goal from it. Caitlin Ford has sco- always scores an, uh, one because they never close it down for, uh, in those North London derbies as well. It does kind of beg the question why 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 things like that happen. But when that uh, I'm not criticising the shot. The shot is perfect. I'm I'm not trying to criticise the defending. It just feels like it, it's it's, def- it's it's defensive lapse. I mean, firstly. The, it's a, it's a short corner. You've got to be alert from set pieces. And if you can mm. see that there's a, there's a chance for that, you, know, you need to get a player out there to close it down. And the moment that ball rolls to the edge of the box, the Sweden the defeat Sweden defence has to push out. It has to swarm. Has to be like saying there's a, there's a danger of a of a long range shot here. I need to slide in and get the block in. And, and it's just it's the end of the game. And they and it's they've caught, been caught up in the emotion of the, of the moment. And and they've 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 they fumbled it. And football is ruthless. And Spain. I mean, it's been much publicised, um, the issues they have behind the scenes. But, you know, make no mistake, they've got some of the most talented and experienced players um, who maybe not on the international scene, but certainly on the club scene, know how to win these sort of games, these clutch moments. Anyone who saw and seen the likes of Barcelona play in Europe um, will know. They know what it takes to win in these moments. If it's one or a few seconds left, they'll find a way. Um, and Sweden pay the ultimate price it, w- it was there for them they'd done all the hard work um you know they should have taken it to extra time and if they had i would have backed them um but it's it's another tournament that that slipped through i think that's because they got semi just to work back actually think back actually they got because they got the semi-finals in 20 in in the last summer 22 and then they got to the semi-finals in 2019 uh i don't think they did in 2017 um so yeah three three semis in a row um and they yeah, they've just not taken that next step, and it's a bit of a shame. And um, one wonders with that team, it's not a young team, a um, lot of experience in there, how many of those players will be um, playing in the Euros in Switzerland in, in two years' time? Will they get a better crack? Because I think this, the tournament this year was open enough that Sweden could have done it. Absolutely, and especially if they beat in America and, and Japan on the way. They they were good enough that they could have done it, and I think that they're going to kick themselves for that. Was that one of the, the reasons why you wanted Sweden to go through? Was because they they sometimes when these draws are made, essentially um, some some teams will say that they got an easier route, some teams will say they got a harder route. <laughs> but, uh, but this that the other you can name names or what whatever but essentially you have to play who you play mm. you end up playing the likes of japan who have blitzed spain or uh 
face a Netherlands side and just scrape past. It 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 seems like there are, sooner or later someone's going to find you out and you should have been knocked out. Um, there have been moments in World Cups before where you kind of look at some teams and go, "How are you still in this competition?" and it just it, that's usually the England men, quite frankly. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 2018. It's like, how on earth have we how on earth have we got to us? How have we fluked yeah. our way to yeah. a semi-final? And then we got found out by Croatia. My my feeling was with Sweden is that they, they got through, they beat two previous with the reigning champions and the, the, the previous champions before the USA. They beat two really good teams, strong teams in the tournament. Um, and then again, they just fell short with Spain. But my my feeling towards Sweden was sort of, was sort of twofold. It was obviously you know they've got a lot of Arsenal players in there, and they they you know had a lot of never really had success. They've always come close. So at some point, you'd like it to happen. But also, they're playing Spain, a team who I don't think, um, due to the politics, not the players, but because the politics behind the scene, they don't warrant winning a tournament. It, for me, it, it feel politically wrong if they won it. And that's a real shame because the players certainly deserve the chance to win a World Cup. They they are that good. But because of um, how the international team is run, uh, from the manager to the um, the effort behind it and the issue they've got with the players and the strikes, it feels morally wrong that they should uh, win this tournament. I mean, earlier today, we've had the uh, press conferences for the... For the World Cup final, and uh, uh, George Wilder was posed uh, a few, quite a few questions about um, stuff behind the scenes um, with the players and, and how he's managing the team and how those issues he managed. And he just point blank refused to answer the question. He just said, "Next question." Next question. Just refused to answer it, which for me speaks volumes about the toxicity that exists there. And for that, for a person like that and a team of circumstances to win a World Cup feels wrong so i was thinking come on sweden for the greater good <laughs> and also because it's a team i feel more confident beating please slay spain and it wasn't to be um they weren't able to do it and now we have spain in the first fair play spain first ever world cup final it's history for them um massive history we said for years they've underperformed for years they should be getting further tournaments they shouldn't be losing the first knockout game to come across they finally done that they finally reached a, a first ever world cup final and it's been long overdue and you know it and england will is you know there are no easy games we said it before when we played um england played nigeria and colombia no easy games in the world cup you can't you know pinch an easy ride to the final um and we've got probably the most technically gifted team that was in the tournament from the off maybe tied to japan um to, to play in the final um and and if we were to beat spain in the final tomorrow um i don't think you can argue to say that you know we haven't deserved to be world champions it'll be a real test for us and i think likewise to spain as well because you know spain have no experience winning these these uh competitions uh thanks to last summer we do so it'd be interesting to see how that plays out it is an intriguing matter tomorrow um not just from the side of for the love of football or um for the morality of the game sort of thing I've seen people go on about uh, England or Britain as a history, uh, which is one of the reasons why they support in Spain. I've heard all sorts of things about this game from supporters, but um, this isn't about the final. Uh, we should <laughs> talk about the third place playoff. Um, so we'll go straight into it. And within the first minute, Stina Blackstinius has a shot across the keeper. Um which was Mackenzie Arnold of West Ham. Uh, Arnold then decides to push it, push the ball. And luckily, Ellie Carpenter's is there and she just kicks it away. Mm. Uh, yeah. Luckily, or unluckily, I missed that because unfortunately I overslept slightly and I was a bit of a panic. To, by the time I got my stuff all set up, I, I was about three to five minutes in. So I, I rather foolishly missed the opening minutes. But I mean, Stina, I mean, we'll get onto her impact in the game. And I think she definitely had the key impact in the two main um, moments for, for Sweden that, that will win in the game. I think she hasn't had the greatest of tournaments. Frustratingly, she's got a goal. I think she scored against Italy in the in the 5 0 win. Um, but having seen her play so well for Arsenal in the closing moments of last season, I really, really hoped that she was going to have a 
uh, almost like an Amanda. I say Amanda Illestead is the player I wanted Steen to be, to be on the goal scoring front. I really thought that she was going to have a, uh, a really strong run at the uh, maybe at the Golden Boot. Um, sadly, wasn't to be. But thankfully, we have another Arsenal striker picking up the goals, which is nice. Um, so yeah, it's a shame that you know didn't take that chance. And I think there, there were some other chances in the game um, she missed as well. I think she was one. She was um, I'd say, but she was actually ruled offside. And there's been quite a few one v ones I've noticed in the in the in the tournament. She hasn't taken. There was one I think against Japan early on that she did fumble as well. But what she lacks maybe in finishing, I think she gains in her presence at the the front of the attack. Um, as I would say, the classic maybe sort of nuisance value in the box and the ability to hold up the ball and bring others into play, which has been one of her strengths for Arsenal this season. And we saw that in um, in this game, um, as I'm sure we'll get to. And it's not just that. If if you don't see her live, you won't mm. know how important she is mm. in the movement and everything. Um, but we'll go on to this 22nd minute. Ellie Carpenter puts a cross in. It falls to Hayley Rasso and forces Musevich into making a near post save. Mm. Yeah, good save for Musevich. She's had a splendid tournament for Sweden. Um, seemed almost unbeatable at times. You think back to her game against the US, probably the best individual goal, goalkeeping performance of a tournament, I'd say, to keep that a nil-nil because Sweden were absolutely battered in that game. It's a bit of an irony that it was almost the US's um, best performance of the tournament and they got knocked out. Um, I, I would put it, I would say if in the end of tournament awards, I mean, <sighs> Erps is definitely up there, but if Erps doesn't win it, I would give it to Musevic. Um, but yeah, good effort for a good chance for Australia. Um, and I think it's those sort of moments. Australia, I feel, I think they would have, it would have been nice if they'd won bronze in this one. Obviously, we'll get to how the result played out. I just feared that maybe they had, um, they, they'd run out of energy. They'd run out of juice, that all their energy and emotion was spent in that England game. And I think it showed as, as the game progressed. Or, and they regressed, shall we say. Um, and uh, yeah, chance that if they were going to get the bronze, they'd have to have got scored early, and sadly they didn't there. Well, this was one of those ones, wasn't it, where you thought maybe Australia would be able to bring something to this game. Mm. Um, I think we'll talk about this a bit further on, but we'll go in because four minutes later, seeing the Black Sinius wins a penalty, although yes. it has to go to VAR. Yeah. Um, what were your original thoughts on this? So, obviously, it was the roar from the crowd. I think it was it was not given on the pitch, but it was given by VAR. I, think, I just don't remember how it all played out. It was it was ignored by the referee. So, obviously, the crowd roar, and, and you know, you, you, you think something, some skullduggery has happened there. And for me, it's it's clear that her foot is kicked. Um, I mean, it's not. I mean, people talk about contact. There is definite contact. And for me, when it's when it's foot on foot, it's it, you have to be so aware of where your feet are in the box and in relation to other players. And I know it's hard because there are a lot of limbs everywhere, but you have to be so so careful. And it's it's just a it's just a lapse. See, Stina gets her foot kicked, and she's on the move while she does it. Her body, you know, her, her foot is moving. I think she, I think it's a planted foot, but her other foot is in the air, and she's had a, a, a back of her foot kicked just as she's sort of moving the ball away. Hits the turf, you know, I don't blame her because, you know, being kicked in the foot hurts. <laughs> and that has impacted her ability to to play the ball in the box. For me, it, commentators say it's soft and I can understand that. But for me, it's it's a definite pen. It's not like one of those, oh, it's a slight shove. It's a slight nudge. No, there's foot to foot contact. And for me, if that happens in a box, you've got no um, leg to stand on. <laughs> so, for, yeah, for, for use for use of a better phrase. So it was a definite pen. It was given by VAR. It was, it was a, you know, the evidence was pretty clear when you see the contact. Um, it does make you debate, and I was having this debate with someone online, if because it's not, um, I wouldn't say it's an intentional foul. She's not tried to kick Stina in the back of the foot. But so that maybe there should be some sort of middle ground in terms of punishment or, or in terms of the, where the bar is. Problem is with these bar, when you, you can move them about, There'll always be debate whether a you know a foul is or not a foul. For me, any unintentional or um, not, yeah unintentional accidental collision or, or handball for me, I'd give that as an. In, I would like to bring more indirect free kick 
infringements into the box. We don't have enough tap and goes in the penalty area with all the players on on the on the goal line defending them. And I think that's an that's an avenue the, the, you know, that the authorities should go down as maybe a middle ground. So referees can sort of acknowledge infringements but not feel worried about giving such an advantageous set piece opportunity to the opposition. Um, so the more softer infringements you could get that. And I think maybe that would fall into that bracket. But, you know, I'm not Howard Webb. I'm not, um, you know, head of the PGMO or whoever it is who makes these decisions. Um, so, you know, what do I know? But it was in the current rules of the game for me, a clear foul and a really good penalty taken by uh, by Rolfo. And probably on the balance of play, I would say, deserved. And I think as the game progressed, I think we saw um, Sweden have a lot of experience in bronze medal matches. I mean, put it this way, they, because they keep going to semifinals and losing, they're quite used to playing these games. And it, it showed quite a lot. They they were able to um, you know, play out this game very well. I think Australia became more and more desperate. There was a lot of just, just panic crosses in, hoping someone would connect to it. The attack wasn't that fluent. And Sam Kerr, I think, I think, I think Sam Kerr, did she play the 90 minutes in the end? I believe she did, yes. Yeah, there, there was a moment, I mean, I don't want to jump ahead too much, um, but yeah, certainly it did feel more, like it was back like with the England game, it was just give the ball to Sam Kerr and just abandoning what, what had been so good for them earlier in the tournament. Uh, just on this point, because it was one of those games, looking at this incident alone, what probably makes it a penalty just for me was the fact that Stina passed it onto the wing. So I believe it was Rolfo who was Dang. actually on that side. I might be completely wrong. It might have mm. uh, been one of the full backs. But she's gone to play it in. And as soon as she's played it in the cross and the ref- referee hasn't blown, so she's left it. <laughs> uh, but no one's on the end of it. It was a brilliant cross. Just a bit mm. of a shame that no one could get on the end of it. I think it was a bit too high in the end. Um, but... There was another incident. Unfortunately, I've missed this one. Um, <laughs> Caitlin Ford ended up with a bandage on her head. For, yes, she coming did. Together. Yeah. Um, so I just, Adam, explain what happened because so, yes. unfortunately my TV decided that <laughs> I, could, I couldn't watch this. I could watch it and I'm, I'm rather, um, I, don't say it was, I rather regret that I did because it's a bit of a seconder. So, Australia are are pushing late in the game for an equalizer, late in the half, sorry, the first half yeah. injury time, pushing for an equalizer. Um, bit of a scramble in the box, ball ends up on the edge of the box as Lani sprints to the box and hacks the ball clear. But she's done this on the move. And so she she's kicked it through and she's almost, because she's kicked the ball so hard, she's ended up on one leg and she's almost gone aerial. At the same time, Ford has run in from the side um, trying to keep the ball in play, and the two have just collided. Not intentional. There's no foul. There's no intent. It's just two people colliding on the edge of the box at high speed, head to head. You know, both on the deck, out of it. Um, thankfully, the ref did eventually call to end of play. Caitlin Forster uh, sits up, and already she's got a huge swelling above her eye. Um, so obviously. You can, Protocols come in, head injury protocols come in, as Lani is taken off for treatment as well. This was at the end of the half, um, and I think it is to their benefit that it was. If this was in the middle of the game, if this was, say, 60 minutes, 65 minutes, and this happened, I would wager both players would have been subbed off pretty soon. Um, pretty much, I would have thought concussion protocols kicked in. I thought, for the record, I thought, and I said on Twitter, I thought Aslani and Ford should have been subbed off. The moment we saw that Caitlin Ford had, well, part of her eye was obscured by this lump that was brewing on her eyebrow. For me, it was, yeah, you get them off concussion protocols. It's not worth the risk. This is a, this, there is, there are no stakes in this game. This is a, this is a bronze match playoff. Um, and I appreciate, I mean, I, I hold the bronze medal in quite high regard when I look back to 2015. And what it did for England, but in the grand scheme of things, this is not the World Cup final. This is the the the. Oh, it's almost the dead rubber with a with a little trinket at the end. It's not worth keeping Caitlin Ford on to chase the game, and there are players on the bench you can bring on for her. But no, second half, both players come out. Um, Ford with a bandage on your head, like you say. I was really surprised. I, again, like I said, I thought they'd both be subbed off, but they played on. Uh, I think, and I mean, Ford Ford played the 90 minutes. I think I don't know if Aslani did. I'll just I think Ford definitely played the 90 minutes because she ended up having the last touch of the. Aslani did go off, and Caitlin didn't go off. 
yeah, it's like Herty came on. Sorry, Herty came on first Lani. So she, she um, and they kept her on, and she 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 was kept on long enough as it all get to to have um, quite a major impact on the game as it happened. Um, but yeah, I was. I think that the fact that it was over, it was right at the end of the first half. They gave them 15 minutes to give them a proper medical going over in the changing room. You know, bandage fought up, do the full concussion protocol checks, and and clearly, luckily, that by the medical team, they were deemed fit enough to play. And um, I suppose, in some sense, we should be grateful that it appears that no lasting damage has happened. But it was a very, very bad collision. Just want to make it known that there is 17 days before Arsenal do play that Champions League qualifier against yeah. Linko Ping. So, mm. <laughs> do not afford to have any more injuries, but I imagine well, Caitlin I, will not be taking any part of that no. because of what happened. I hope so. There was, I should say, um, Jonas was asked about some of his players, and it was things after the semi final. He talked about uh, Alessio Russo, and he was talking about, well, he, got, he was mentioning that he's got this Champions League game, and you know, will Russo play any part? And I think he was suggesting that she was. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, she was thinking, oh, crikey, Russo is going to come off a World Cup final. And two weeks later, she's having to play a Champions League for Arsenal. It's going to be, that's going to be quite a, you know, no, no rest. Um, sadly for her, it would, it would appear. And I expect, you know, if Ford is fit, if Ford is fit to play, um, and so is Catley, I'm guessing that they will, they will have a role to play in, in that game as well. But we'll see what happens. Well, maybe that might be one thing that happens is maybe play the game games we won't see what happens because there won't be a champions league game or anything until october i believe it is i think it's the start of october is the other qualifier um or just after the first game of the champions league season but anyway we should get on with this game yep. <laughs> uh, the 61st minute stina blackstinius plays a lovely ball back to uh aslani with mm. a rocket right into the far part post yeah, brilliant goal. This, um, it's a, it comes on a bit of a counter. Obviously, Australia push, trying to push forward with what reserves they have left to try and chase an equaliser in this game and give the crowd something to cheer um, as their tournament sort of winds down. But they get pinged on the counter. It's a good ball over top. Stina chases it, holds onto the ball. The defence defenders hold her up. Um, she retains the ball, delays the ball. Uh, Aslani comes on the edge of the box. Stina sees her, rolls it across, and she just buries it in the bottom corner. It's a superb. Finch, very accurate drive, and that pretty much clinched the game for Sweden. Um, I was a bit worried, actually, because it I thought maybe Stina was offside. It did look close on the replays. Uh, but thankfully, in the World Cup, we have the very snazzy semi-automatic offside um, uh, machine, virtual reality, digital system, uh, which I think is amazing. And I, w- I want the Premier League to adopt this Im- immediately because I think it's great, especially if they can put those graph- the graphics up on the on the screen um but i do look forward to the moment when they do that get the, the digital graphic up in the wall and it says offside and it shows the the person's offside and it's just their kneecap is just poked through the wall just a little nub there and said oh he's offside because his kneecap was through because i i mean i would love it um except if it's an arsenal player who's offside but i'd love it thinking oh that was marginally close but you can guarantee that every pundit will be you know grab your torch and pitchforks and let's march and pgml like that was an outrageous decision Thankfully, in this case, it wasn't that close. Dean, it was quite a distance onside, and it was uh, it was a good call to let the game go. And, and as I said earlier, she's she didn't score in this game, but she had two major impacts in the game that did determine the result. And Aslani, who managed to take off that knock, um, buries a chance. Two 0 Sweden, and yeah, the rest of the thirty minutes, the rest of the game. I think I mean I think there was one chance I think for Stina off this that she was one v one but she was actually offside so it it was irrelevant and she didn't score it but yeah it felt like after that the game just sort of slowly just sort of died it was Australia they had thirty minutes to score two goals they didn't really like scoring after that um all the only other thing I can remember I don't know if you're going to come to this watch I'll, I'll let I'll, I'll let you read out the next incident because it might be one thing I'm going to talk about so I don't want, okay I don't want to jump too far ahead so that is my last one uh, my, my last point so if, okay if was, so it, there, was a, there was a there was a clash in the only other thing I remember there was a clash in the center circle and Sam Sam Kerr got chopped down um with a, a slide tackle and you, and you did worry if maybe her tournament was going to end as it started with, a, with an injury and as it turns out it was actually more that when in a tackle she just got scissored and there was a knee in the back of the in the back of the calf and it was just a bit sore and, and you know she came on and, and carried on playing it would have been it would have been sad for Kerr if she 
had gone off, say, as you know, injured or on a stretcher. Um, and fair play to her, she wanted to stay on to try and, and turn the game, but it, it was just a game that was that was never in their grasp. And I've said this before, and I've discussed this on the previous pods. Um, Sam Kerr is an amazing striker and an amazing captain for Australia. That she's their star forward. I do think that bringing her in for these last two games has cost Australia the the chance of the World Cup, and that is not because uh, it's not because that Sam Kerr has had some sort of negative impact because of how good how she is, but simply because that the team had evolved without her her absence, and it's almost uh, a tragedy, sort of a Shakespearean tragedy that her that that's the way it's worked out for her. I feel if she'd started from the off from the first um, game um, against. Uh, the Republic of Ireland, I think it was way back then. God, that feels that feels so long ago, doesn't it? The Steph Catley penalty, really and, and 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 no, uh, and and, Mc, and the Irish being so brave. But if Kerr had been fit throughout the whole tournament and integrated in the team from the off and grown with the team, and they got this far, then I think it would have been absolutely fine. But I just think that the key change, the gear shift to switching from a team strike force to a Kerr strike force, is what's undone Australia here. Um, they had they've been a, they've been an amazing host. Nation, co-host nation. We shouldn't forget New Zealand, and they had, an, you know, they didn't get the group, but they had their great moments, and um, you know, beating Norway. We shouldn't forget that on opening night. But Australia is the other co-host. Um, went deep in the tournament, did their country proud. Um, I think it's just, yeah, the host, the fact that they were host nation, I think, got them as far as the semi-final. But I think once they got to semi-final, I think their shortcomings really got exposed, and by the end of the Australia game. Those, they, they look spent. They look absolutely spent. They look emotionally spent, physically spent. I think by the end, by the time they were playing England, it was very much sort of running on maybe a bit of vibes and a bit, a bit of you know, right, trying to ride the crest of the emotion and obviously the Sam Kerr equaliser. But once England beat them, they, 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 their just legs have just gone, and it's it's a bit of a shame because. As I said about the bronze medal match, I do hold, I do like this, but no, it's not everyone's cup of tea. But I do quite like the bronze medal match, and I know as a the 2015 World Cup, yes, it was a bit cruel the way we lost to Japan. But I I hold that Germany game and beating Germany, which was a big thing for England. I know we've done it a few more times since, but back then it was a huge thing to beat Germany in a, in a tournament. To beat them and to win bronze, I know for a lot of the elder uh, lionesses who sadly retire before um, they get the chance to play in the tournaments, the likes of Alex Scott, the likes of uh, Farrah Williams who scored on that day, they hold that bronze medal in very high regard. And it, it, it changed to do that to win bronze. It changed a lot back home. It, it really helped add a bit more um, energy into the growth of the women's game and so with the WSL. And you just wonder if Australia, if they could have maybe got this bronze medal and given them something to to wear around their necks. It is only bronze, I know. It would have been a nice way to sort of sign the tournament off. Because um, no doubt in terms of for the growth of the sport, it's been amazing. Seeing the fans, the Matilda fans, selling out the stadiums, huge TV, you know, uh, watching figures uh, where they are. Um, it's not a con- I mean, Australia has its own league, but it's it's... It's not at the same level I said to WSL, but WSL is a bigger league, and a lot of the players juggle between playing there and playing in America. It's it was a it was a big moment for them. It's a big tournament for them, and I think they've been terrific co-hosts. It's just a shame they couldn't get that that little flourish at the end that would have given them uh, a a trophy, uh, well, a trophy, but like a medal to remember it by. But Sweden. I mean, they won the bronze medal last time. Um, I know because they beat us <laughs> the last time England. The last game England lost to the World Cup was that bronze medal match. And to think four years ago, someone had told me after we lost to Sweden and we were very much like Australia in this game. We just mm-hmm. lost to USA, emotionally gone, physically gone. Phil Neville just disregarded it the whole. Um, that was uh, the problem, uh, wasn't it? Yeah. He turned around and said he didn't want to be yeah. part of this. Match. He'd rather be on the plane right yeah, now. Exactly. He was so bitter and it really showed. Um, and that performance, because we'd put so much, invested so much in the USA game in that semi-final, we had nothing for the Sweden game and, and it was a very poor game and they they, be, they deservedly beat us. But if you told me then, when we lost to Sweden and we were on our knees, that four years later, we had not only won the Euros, but we'd be in the World Cup final, I'd have laughed at you because I, I couldn't see anything from that to get to where we are now and, and maybe australia should maybe look at that and think you know they they're, they're a wounded animal now but it's you can build on from this and maybe there is a pathway for them to, to kick on for um wherever the world cup is hosted next 
Um, and I would be surprised if they got to another semi-final, quite frankly. I think it, it's well within them. If, if the FA invest and grow the team further, because clearly, you know, they, they do need a bit more support. But the potential is there for them to certainly do it. They've also got some great players coming through. Courtney Vine, uh, mm. actually playing in the Australian leagues at the moment. She is actually a uni student. Um, but hero, hero, but, hero of the shootout. Hero, yeah. you mean, she is. He was the hero in the in the France penalty shootout. There were plenty of players that can be the takeaway and sort of say, look, you don't have to go over to the Europe as you've seen, and you can still be at home, be like mm. a hometown hero for a lot of these players. Um, I think that I think the biggest thing at the moment is the legacy for Australia. What is it going to be, especially for New Zealand? New Zealand don't have a league. They're hoping to get their league sorted out soon. Yeah, New Zealand's tricky because of the location and because of the size of the of the country. And it's, I think it'd be tough for them to create a, a women's league. I don't know if it, I mean from I don't know much about New Zealand football. I don't know if they have a men's league as well. I don't know what the sort of the football landscape is there. But certainly there are players in that New Zealand team that deserve to play in the, in the major leagues. Maybe there could be some sort of joint Australia-New Zealand league, like they were co-hosts. But we should also remember that Australia and New Zealand, it's not like its not like the UK and Ireland. You know, they are hundreds of hundreds of miles apart and there would be a lot of to and fro jetting if they were to put some sort of joint league together. But if I yeah. remember, I think Wellington actually do play in the Australian league. Well, yeah, there you go. Then maybe that is is how it, how it would work. Then maybe that yeah, you, know, you could get some sort of professional league between the two. But it's it's yeah, it's all about now looking forward to these two countries and on what what do they want to do with their women's team and how much they want to push it. And I think New Zealand. I don't think it's going to sound really cruel, but I don't think they're going to be like Australia. I just don't think there is the capacity for them to grow to the level of say England. I mean, they've been in the They've been in the you know, in the cycle for ages, but they've always been one of the lowest seeded teams. I remember when we beat them in 2011, um, 2-1, and you know that was a bit of a comeback win um, at the time. New Zealand you know, gave a very good account of themselves, and thankfully Jill Scott and Jess Clark had their shooting boots on. Um, but I do struggle to see how they will advance beyond their sort of ranking, I say, in, in world football. Australia have definitely got the potential. They've got the, the, the size um of the of, of the they've got the resources available to do it it would just be interesting to see how much they they push on from this but i think there is a good chance for a, a strong australian legacy but only if they want to if they want to do it because these things don't happen automatically you yeah the hard work the real hard work starts now and once again sweden with a bronze medal always <laughs> uh, <laughs> the bridesmaids never the bride that is sweden isn't it that's what they say I think they're kind of bittersweet, aren't they? Because I remember Asalani coming out with a quote where she's fed up of crying in semi-finals and things like that. And it's, just, I just have a feeling sooner or later it's going to happen for them because they've got mm. such a time to the squad. It's going to happen soon, or if it doesn't happen, it's a missed opportunity. And it, um, it, it does feel like that. I mean, I think Aslani, I think broke a record. She's like the first player to score. It was someone like she's she scored in the last bronze medal match as well. She scored against mm. England. It was something like she's like the first player to score in two bronze medal matches in a row or something like that. Because obviously, <laughs> usually the same the same teams don't normally get into into bronze matches, but Sweden do. Yes, it's it 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 is very much a case of untapped potential. I think for Sweden, they are they're not going to like they're not playing outlandish brilliant free-flowing attacking football like maybe japan or or or, or spain are but they're certainly a, they're a very stable secure unit um hard to beat and if this makes sense they are good at what they're strong at which obviously set pieces um they don't give many goals away i think two is the most they've conceded in a game at this world cup um, in fact, I think yeah, the Spain game is the is, yeah. yes, the Spain game is the most goals they conceded at this World Cup. They conceded two goals. Oh, all of them has been one, one goal. I think the only the only other time they've been behind in this World Cup was against um, shock and horrors South Africa, <laughs> which was a bit of a woe. Um, and until up until the Spain game, they were able to hold on to their leads. Or you know, all the first scorers and taking the lead. They're a very stable, very secure team, um, very rounded team. Yeah, they. Again, it's it's just this potential. You've got to wonder what is that extra five percent? Because it was the same for us of England under uh, Mark Sampson, Phil Neville. It was always um, getting to the semi-final, 
and, and then just falling short. And it was always a close, well, well, in the World Cup, it was close. It was two one defeats to USA and Japan, and it was always it always felt like we were in the in the fight, and we were just you know things didn't go away. We you know missed penalty, fluky own goals, you know goals chalked for offside. Um, Euro twenty seventeen, okay, we weren't even close. <laughs> Let's just be honest. There, we were we were trounced by the Netherlands, and and deservedly so. It seem it feels the same with Sweden that they are. It feels like they're on the cusp, but. The, you only get so many cracks before eventually before eventually your, your space is taken and someone else is d- doing the rounds and i fear for sweden if this might if this if this because it's an older squad if these players drop off and and they don't have the the stroke for players coming for the next wave for the next um for the euros in switzerland shall we say we may not see them see them in semi-finals we may see them in the in the quarterfinals and it's hard to believe that only you know two years ago I think it was they're an Olympic final they're an Olympic final and uh you know they were one kick away from actually winning a gold medal and you could argue they would have deserved that medal for you know the hard work they put in interesting also Australia did actually play in a bronze medal match in that in that game in that tournament as well in Olympics um rather than more exciting than this one it was a 4-3 thriller um they sadly lost to the US um yeah I, I do wonder if maybe this is maybe Sweden's last calling and that would be a bit of a shame really so we are just going to finish now. Um, so we'll just go through our socials. So Adam, where can people find you? Well, you know, it's people may not want to find me. So <laughs> I don't know if I should devolve this information. For the greater good, it might. Okay, if you do want to find me, um, if you, which you know, fine, you know, <laughs> it's at Adam Salter Four, where I talk about women's football and 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 some other you know nonsense and uh, try to be you know relatively humorous and occasionally i wind up lottie and matt as well but only on occasion <laughs> mine is at matt lr 28 we also are on vic a at v a w podcast yeah on, on twitter i had to try and remember that first time <laughs> luckily i did um and lottie's is at lottie underscore a w f c Thank you for joining Vic Acres Wonderland. Should, say, should just say, Matt, it's VAW Pod. VAW Pod. Thank you. I, I knew that. Not podcast. I'm that's, so that's, that's, close. That's, that's, so somebody close. Else's, that's somebody else's Twitter at. So just, yeah, don't. Oh, no. follow, well, probably. If, if it isn't, it is by the end of the podcast because someone will take <laughs> it and, and we'll have an imitation podcast Twitter account, unfortunately. But yes, at VAW Pod, if you want to follow our pod on Twitter, where we'll have all the Twitter updates uh, and pod updates, YouTube updates, whatever you name it, and it'll all be there. And should also yes. say on that one, at the moment we're on 99 followers. Just check now, we're on 99 followers. So if, if one more person can jump on and follow our Twitter account, that'll be grand. <laughs> yes, uh, everyone, Lottie's been sharing the uh, mm. the amount of stats that we're going through. Mm. We're, we're on 500 hours, I think, of listeners and Thank you audio, very much. Which is brilliant. Uh, we're on, we're on just over a hundred subscribers on YouTube. So thank you very much for joy, uh, subscribing. If you have, and if you haven't, please do check it out. Uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And oh, sorry, comment. Matt. I should add, I got that wrong. We're following ninety nine people. <laughs> so we're, we've got, but 40, yeah, keep forty five. Right, so, yeah, forty five. There yeah. we go. We're, so we're close, but we're getting there. <laughs> we're getting there. It's all right. It's all right. Um, so unfortunately, Lossie couldn't be here tonight. She, uh, she had other plans, but we do, we will see her back for the World Cup final, which is England versus Spain. I'm sure everyone's got their own nerves, and or some that some people aren't going to sleep. But we will hopefully see you all soon. Thank you for yep. joining us. Goodbye. Mm-hmm.